1926, uh, Glenn Clark, professor of English and coach of track and football at the small McAllister College in St. Paul, was invited to become the teacher of a Sunday morning Bible class at Plymouth Congregational Church in Minneapolis. He'd become well known because of his book on prayer, The Soul Sincere Desire, and the copy of that book is for sale. One copy left, is the last I saw on the far table there. Uh, he'd become well known because of that book on prayer, which was the outgrowth of a couple of gripping articles of his that had appeared in Atlantic Monthly Magazine. And of course, every professor of English just loves to have an essay printed in Atlantic Monthly Magazine. And he tried for years, but this was accepted with enthusiasm. His book had drawn much attention, and he began receiving contacts from many, many people, most of them ordinary people. But a few names we recognize. Dr. Arthur Holt. He pioneered the earliest CFOs in New England. Roger Babson, the financial genius. Gerald Stanley Lee, a recognized American author in the early 20th century. Grace Hemingway, the mother of Ernest Hemingway. And I remember Grace Hemingway at Coronas. Uh, George Washington Carver, the saintly black agriculturalist. Uh, Alexis Carell, winner of the Nobel Prize in Medicine. A. N. Williams, the CEO of Western Union. Walter Russell, the sculptor. Toyohika Kagawa, the great Japanese theologian, evangelist, scholar, and social activist. Larry Gould, geologist, second in command of Admiral Byrd's expeditions to Antarctica, and later president of Carleton College. Kate Smith, the popular vocalist, and Norman Vincent Peale, and many others. His Bible class at Plymouth became a laboratory of creative spirit for the rest of his life. One Sunday, he threw out the idea of athletes of the spirit uh, as an illustration of how a Christian can train for the goal of living in the kingdom of heaven right here on earth. He'd written a little booklet about it, Power in Athletics, and I don't think that book is on the table back there but I think it may be available. Once when I was a boy and Glenn was in our home, the two of us somehow talked about baseball. And Glenn told me that he could throw a ball over our house. And then he asked me to imagine what would happen if I should throw a ball over the house and not let go of the ball. <laughs> Well, I'll let you decide uh, what lesson he was trying to teach me. <laughs> well, on that Sunday, uh, some in his Bible class insisted on taking the idea of training athletes of the Spirit seriously. Why not have a training camp for the life of the Spirit, just like Glenn, a college football coach, had for his players for three weeks before the football season began? But how could a professor with no money and a family to support, do that. Twelve businessmen underwrote a three-week camp. Glenn chose the name, Camp Farthest Out. It was held in July 1930 at the Lake Coronas Assembly Grounds near Painesville, Minnesota, about 90 miles west of the Twin Cities. The accommodations were quite rustic in the early years. Most campers lived in dormitory rooms with beaver board partitions, pitchers and basins for washing, and bed springs supported by wooden horses. For meals, campers sat on backless benches at long tables. The refrigeration of food in the kitchen was either with ice that had been cut from the lake or cold artesian well water that continuously circulated around submerged food in large open tanks. The youth would earn CFO scholarships by waiting on the tables. The CFO camps at Lake Coronas have continued now annually. They've had actually 76 camps at this point. 
Uh, the length of the camps at Coronas was soon shortened from three to two weeks, and then in 1948 to one week. As a child at CFO, my greatest attractions were the dock with 12 wooden rowboats that were always available, and a bathing beach with a raft and a diving board. I'd like to share with you a paper written by Helen May Clark Olson on the camp in 1930. Uh, Helen May tells me that now at 89 years of age, she is possibly the only original camper still living. And she, she wrote this for the uh, annual meeting in Minneapolis back in May. And some of you, if you were there, may remember this was, was this read in Minneapolis? I, I wasn't there, so, but I have, I have her copy here. On a July day in 1930, the dream of Glenn Clark to start camps farthest out became a reality. Seventy persons came together, most not knowing anyone else except for some who had attended the Bible class in Minneapolis. Glenn had received the first letter of acceptance from Carolyn Sparrow, I'm so thrilled at the idea of making ourselves complete channels for the Christ through us, so I'm going two weeks early and be quiet there with God. Others came with that spirit from east and west and from north and south. Nineteen states represented the 70 chosen souls, and they blended together. Glenn Harding led the singing at the Galilean Hour. As we said, and I'll tell you about, they called it the Galilean hour, the evening. What we're having right now, they called the Galilean hour because it was right there on the lake shore. And if you look at some pictures on the table over there, you can see the steps of the dormitory that went down toward the lake. And we all sat on the steps, and Glenn Harding was out there uh, on, on the ground uh, directing uh, the singing. Uh, so uh, it says, we sat on the steps of the dormitory dining hall, warding off the mosquitoes. I don't remember the mosquitoes, but I had a good time. Uh, Glenn Clark gave two talks a day, 42 talks. One in the morning at the spiritual orchestration hour. That's what they called the morning uh, talk time. And the other in the evening at the Galilean hour. After the morning talk, Ruth Kennel had rhythms using flimsy scarves. The men were not too happy with this. <laughs> so Alice Kraft used the Volga boat song, using our bodies to row the boat, which appealed to the men during devotions in motion. Glenn Clark had creative writing, and Claire Boyer had charge of the art hour. Vivian Kombacker had been sent to the island farthest out, Camp, Camp Mohican, off the coast of Maine, to learn physical coordination. And she brought this skill back to the uh, CFO, where we learned to roll over, plop, uh, like a sack of flour, walk with a book on our heads, and learn to relax as a cat. Why to try that? <laughs> In the afternoon, there was a prayer session, but not in individual groups at that time. There was a time that business and professional men told how they took God into their companies. The day ended with singing and the evening talk. As the CFOs evolved, many of the day's activities changed, as you can see. But we learned to put every phase of our lives under the leadership and control of God. The campers included families, singles, men and women, and children. Ages ranged from Glenn Harding's two-month-old son, Harold, uh, to Miss Hood in her 80s. When planning for that first CFO, people had not realized a few children would be there. My, children, my, my sister, Marion, was 12, Miles was 10, and I was 14. We went to the things we liked. Rhythms, singing, talks, writing, and art, etc. 
Because there was no provision for small children, Mary and Miles and I acted as babysitter. One familiar, familiar ritual every day or so was Glenn Harding hanging up diapers at the arrival of each of their sons. <laughs> uh, camp was three weeks, and we had one day of fun skits. Dad wore knickers, so many did a takeoff of Glenn Clark hitching up his pants. The whole camp did a lot of laughing. It was a joyous time. And Dad, as well as others, did a lot of counseling and sharing as they conversed on the benches of the grounds. Some families, etc., rented cottages that rimmed the camp area. There was not an abundance of indoor plumbing and not the greatest heat at times, and the walls of the dorm, dorm rooms did not extend all the way to the ceiling. But it was all a fun, joyous, uplifting experience. Though the dormitory rooms were noisy, one could hear everything in the next room. We made a joke of it. And Edith Dalby wrote a song about it that was used for years. And I remember Edith Dalby and her husband. He was a minister. I, they were from Kansas, I believe. And they had a, a daughter that was a little older than, than I was. Well, here's, here's what the Edith wrote. When you are climbing up Jacob's ladder, here are a few points you must not forget. Make yourself soundless. That is the first rung. If others bang loudly, you simply can't fret. Down falls a hairpin, it sounds like a ten pin. Down drops a shoe, it sounds like a trunk. Whisper a lullaby, sounds like a choir. Aren't you sorry you brought so much junk? <laughs> Brushing your teeth sounds like a geyser. Moving your bed like the wild bulls of Bashan. Counting your money like a rattling caboose. When you are yawning, stretching, and twisting, shaking the trash all out of your head, remember the poor soul sleeping below you. He thinks you're an earthquake, shaking him dead. <laughs> Glenn developed contacts with other prominent individuals during the course of the early camps. Otto Mollery, uh, an economist in President Hoover's cabinet. Eugene Briggs, the president of Phillips University. Daniel Fleming, former missionary to China and the professor of missions at uh, uh, Union Theological Seminary in New York. Walter Holbing, a premier New York merchandiser at Bonwet Teller and Tiffany. Jeffrey Short, president of Quaker Oats. Thomas Watson, founder of IBM. That's something I didn't know. Uh, Mina Edison, the widow of Thomas Edison. Arthur Compton, winner of the Nobel Prize in Physics, and Ralph Budd, president of the Pullman Corporation and Burlington Railroad. When the campers returned home from Lake Coronas, many began to hope for camps closer to their homes. In 1930, there was only one camp in Minnesota. In 1931, there were two, Minnesota and Maine. In 1935, the Maine camp moved to Star Island, uh, 10 miles at sea, accessible by boat from Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and camps were held there off and on until 1956. And I thought I would show you, if I could find them, uh, some, some pictures here. How many of you remember Life magazine? Raise your hand. Life, okay, put your hands down. Now, how many of you remember when Life magazine came out every week? Not so many. Came on Fridays. I always looked for it in our mailbox, I remember. Uh, well, one of the features in the Weekly Life magazine uh, was uh, uh, a series called Life Goes to a Certain Place. Uh, every week it was different. Well, this one week it was Life Goes to a Summer Religious Conference. There it is. Life, life goes to a summer religious conference. And I'll just scan through some of these pictures that were in Life magazine so that you can see them. Pictures from Star Island and our CFO there. This is at the upper left. 
That, of course, is a prayer broadcast. I guess they thought that would be something interesting to put in the magazine. And uh, Glenn, Cl Glenn, uh, there's Glenn Clark here. Uh, this is Glenn Clark's wife, Louise. And this, I believe, is Helen Wentworth, Glenn Clark's sister. And she lived in Chicago, so I got to know her rather well. She was a house mother in a woman's dormitory uh, at the University of Chicago. And uh, so we, we knew her through the Chicago CFO group. So uh, those are just some pictures. Let me, let me just go through another page. There are three, three pages of this pictures in, in, from Life magazine. Uh, let me get this one. That was uh, <laughs> girls in the girls in the dining hall uh, did this with their towels out on the uh, out on the on the on the grass, I guess, but by the water. This is Alice Kraft uh, leading uh, leading a uh, some, I guess you call it creative dance or something. Uh, uh, a row of people. Uh, climbing up a hill, uh, striving to go upward, and a man hanging on at the end, <laughs> seemingly pulling him back. <laughs> this on the left is a painting session, doing art. Everybody did it. No, no, didn't have any choices. It's all, no, no options. This, of course, is a, a session of rhythms. And these are just some rocks. Uh, it's a very rugged country. <laughs> this is in the chapel. And I got one more, one more transparency. There's a beautiful, a beautiful chapel there. Uh, and. It, and it's quite, quite historic, built back in the 1700s. I don't know what these girls are doing, but they're, they got some, some, what do you call those things? <laughs> Scars that they're, they're waving. Yeah. Uh, this on the left uh, is a sort of a snake dance or something in the, in the, di in, the, in the lobby of the hotel, and that's Glenn Harding in front of the line leading it. He was a young man back then. And then finally, here's a song period out on the porch uh, at the, uh, the sunset time in the day. So that was an enriching uh, camp experience. And if any of you ever been to Star Island? Okay. Uh, uh, it's tied in with the the, the, the Winnie camp. Um, I don't know whether Winnie started Star Island or Star Island started Winnie. I think it's that way. Well, let me continue here. That was 1935. There were there were um, camps were held until 1956. In 1936, there were three camps. In 1939, four. In 1945, five. By the 50th anniversary in 1980, there were 65 camps in North America. And in this year, the 75th year, I count 52 camps and 23 retreats in North America. Uh, Glenn Clark saw early that he couldn't be the only speaker in all the camps. Others were needed. He didn't want scholars or great orators. He wanted leaders who had a close walk with Jesus, who were effective in prayer and were seeking for God to guide and empower them. And I remember how in 1940, Star Daly, a former criminal, became the second speaker. And in 1942, when Frank Laubach, the great missionary and teacher of literacy to million and th millions in 300 languages, became the third speaker. In a few years, Rufus Mosley, Louise Eggleston, Agnes Sanford, 
Ruth Robinson, Roland Brown, and John Gaynor Banks were added to this group of speaking leaders. Now, I have a few pictures to show you of them. This is a picture with Mary Light, Mitty Waters, Marge Lawrence, and Glenn Clark. That's Glenn Clark there, the man. <laughs> Didn't think you'd have trouble with that. <laughs> but this is Star Daly. Knew him well. Spent time in our home. He wrote a book about my father's ministry and uh, titled, entitled Recovery. And I, I think it's out of print now. This was Frank Laubach. Very late in his life, I think he, he died not long after this. Eighty. I remember when he would turn 70, and uh, he was a coronas. Uh, this is Tommy Tyson and Francis Tyson when they were younger. <laughs> This is was Agnes Sanford, Ruth Robison. Who is this? Norman Elliot, a lot younger. <laughs> He's been here. This is Kermit and Helen May Olson. Helen May is the one who wrote that story about the first camp, and her husband. This was taken in 1961, this picture. This is Bernie Warfield, uh, pastor of a church in Michigan, and he was one of the CFO speakers. This is, who, would, who knows who this is? Okay, I'll tell you. This is Catherine Marshall, uh, wife of Peter Marshall. Verna Gale taught, uh, led creative art for years and years at Coronas and at other places. This was Charles King. He led uh, singing. This was taken at the Oregon camp in 1962. This was Marge Lawrence, a good friend of ours from Benton Harbor, Michigan. That's kind of faint. Fred and Maisie Bell Markham, and Ed Gilmore and his wife. This was Alice Kraft. You can't see her face, though, so it's hard to recognize her. This is Mary Ryan. And this last one is uh, Paul Wilkinson. Maybe I need the light switch to turn back on. Somebody? Oh. Try that one there by the door. There we go. Okay. For most of the history of CFO, its popular theme was being a place where campers could learn and practice to live the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. Let's be sure we understand this term. Kingdom refers to a realm where the monarch is revered, praised, respected, counseled, counseled by, watched, listened to, and obeyed. The citizens in the kingdom are called the subjects. Uh, the term kingdom is a picture word, a metaphor, for the circumstance where God's word, God's word is always obeyed by all of his creation, including every person. The emphasis of the kingdom is more on God's reign than on God's realm. When some Pharisees asked Jesus about when the realm of God would be established, Jesus said, the kingdom of God does not come in such a way as to be seen. No one will say, look, here it is, or there it is. Because the kingdom of God is within you. It's a state of relationship. God to persons and persons to God. 
It may be helpful to note that kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God are equivalent terms. In the Gospels, the kingdom of heaven appears only in Matthew. Kingdom of God is used in Mark, Luke, and John, but only rarely in Matthew. We suppose that Matthew uses heaven almost always because of the Hebrew Christian style of the book, whereas Mark, Luke, and John are more Gentile in their style. To the Hebrew readers of Matthew, uh, God was a very sacred word that was used reverently, so reverently, in fact, that it was often replaced by another less sacred word. Hence, kingdom of heaven in Matthew. We Gentile Christians use the two terms interchangeably. At CFO, as we practice Christian living, we listen to one another, uh, we uh, learn from one another, care for one another, love one another, pray for one another, practice patience with one another, rejoice with one another, trust one another, and keep one another's confidences. Our goal is then to return to our families, friends, jobs, and churches and continue using these kingdom practices with them. For these are qualities that God wills for all of his subjects. Jesus taught us to pray, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. We do pray for the kingdom, work for the kingdom, and rejoice in the kingdom, but probably only at times. Our experiences of the kingdom come and go as we and those around us receive them or reject them. The scriptures tell us that the kingdom will be fully and permanently established on earth at the time of Christ's return. Our experience of the kingdom has many benefits as well as requirements. Glenn Clark attempted to live in a kingdom experience for many years. And he learned some things that he's passed along to us, and I'll use Glenn's words. One benefit in the kingdom is that in heaven, whenever you wish to be with a person, at that moment, he or she also desires to be with you. And instantly, you are together. Then when you crave another, those about you vanish instantly to fulfill similar desires of their own, and you are left with the one you need at the moment. Another benefit of the kingdom is that whenever you wish to express beautiful ideas to make another happier, exactly the right inspiration will come to you, or it will come to others who will immediately pass it on to you. A third benefit is that this coming and going of blessed persons, this coming and going of blessed ideas, this perfect synchronization of ideas, of desire and fulfillment, make life one perfect symphony. It's more beautiful than sound alone can produce, or light, or color, or perfume. For this is a whole symphony of souls, a symphony of love and wisdom and happiness, the perfect synchronization of our inmost being with all other beings. It is that that makes heaven the immeasurably beautiful place that it is, the abode of perfect fulfillment and bliss. This heaven may be discovered whenever a person turns to God utterly, completely. Its faint forecast is shown wherever love overcomes hate, and humility overcomes pride, and charity overcomes greed. It begins way down here on earth. So let's take it wherever we go, bearing the good news that the kingdom of God is at hand, and that it begins with me. That's some of what Glenn taught us about the kingdom. At the Corona CFO, uh, Probably when I was seven or eight years old, during a new meal, Glenn Harding, my beloved uh, song leader, got up on a chair and called out, not with dismay, but as a challenging opportunity, a cottage is on fire. 
Well, many ran out of the dining hall down to the far ends of the ascent, end of the assembly grounds by the shore where they saw the fire. Two women campers were living in that cottage, probably because they were on special diets and would prepare their own meals. We got near the cottage and someone shouted that the fire had started with a kerosene cooking stove and much of the kitchen, uh, of the kitchen was ablaze. And many of us formed a brigade and buckets and cans of water were passed from the lake to throw on the fire. But that didn't do much good. The fire continued. I didn't see the miraculous stop to the fire, but my father did. He said that Glenn Clark took one of the buckets to the outside kitchen door, reached in, and threw its entire contents on the fire. Immediately, the entire blaze in the kitchen stopped. Additional buckets of water were thrown, but were probably unnecessary. Eventually, a fire truck arrived from Painesville, but the fire was then no longer burning. After almost everyone had gone, I think that only my father and I remained. And I remember my father filling several abandoned cans with water to leave them available out in front of the cottage. We're talking about living in the kingdom experientially. When we accept Christ as our Lord and Savior, when we commit ourselves to Christ, when we're enabled to live in eternity with Christ, we have entered his kingdom. But we find that we experience the kingdom only some of the time. And we experience life outside the kingdom much of the time. In fact, we may find ourselves inside and outside the kingdom several times a day. We're troubled to admit it, but we flip back and forth. I send our kids off to a friend's house with hugs and ask God's blessing on them. I turn on the TV and see the continued, continuing suffering from the hurricanes. I pray for the entire situation and for those who are helping others. I pull out our checkbook and write a good-sized check to a, an effective relief agency. I thank our Heavenly Father for loving all of his children. And at that moment, a peace falls on me. And I know that I'm experiencing God's kingdom. And then I remember that Sam and Sarah are going to pick me up in 30 minutes. I hurriedly tidy up the kitchen, but spill coffee on the floor. Oh, why, John, did you leave coffee in your cup? I get myself ready as quickly as I can. But where's my watch? I left it right here on the dresser. Somebody must have taken it. <laughs> in fact, I think I know who took it. Just wait till I see her. <laughs> it's time to go. I'm ready at last. I wait and wait and wait. 25 minutes late, and they finally come. As they slide into the car, they're very apologetic about being late. But I say nothing. As we're riding in silence, it occurs to me that my present attitudes are not the way God would have them. Jesus wouldn't be this way, no question about it. God doesn't matter to me at the moment. I've fallen out of the kingdom. Until I restore my relationship with the Father, Sam, and Sarah, I won't be a very effective when I pray or do anything else as a disciple of Jesus Christ. We can't be in the kingdom and out of the kingdom at the same time. We can't live the way of Christ and the way of the world at the same time. We can't bear what Paul in Galatians called the fruit of the Spirit, you know, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, uh, uh, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, and at the same time, exhibit what Paul also in Galatians called the works of the flesh. Can you, can you say those? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> it, 
Immorality, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, envy, strife, jealousy, anger, selfishness, dissension, party spirit, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and the like. I think there are 14 things on the list there. Paul wrote, the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh, for these are opposed to each other to prevent you from doing what you would. He said, I don't do the good I want to do, but I do the very things I don't want to do. I'm indeed a wretched person. There's a very simple test we can give, we can give ourselves at any moment to determine if at that moment we're in the kingdom or out of the kingdom. Are we right now bearing the fruit of the spirit or are we exhibiting the works of the flesh? Are we extending love to another or are we resentful of that person? Gene and I are now using one of Glenn's last books, Windows of Heaven, for our daily morning devotions, as some of you have probably done. And out of curiosity, preparing for this retreat, I went through Windows of Heaven. I went through Windows of Heaven, uh, highlighting every reference to the kingdom that I found. It's almost every page. Well, I'd like to close with one of those pages. I believe that the plan God has for me is wrapped in the folds of my being, even as the oak is wrapped in the acorn and the rose in the bud. I believe that this plan is permanent, indestructible, and perfect free from all that is essentially evil. Any negative experience has no part in my God-created plan. It is simply a distortion caused by my own willfulness and blindness. When I relax and yield trustingly to his leading, I lose all sense of personal responsibility for seeing that his will, that his, that his will is done. I may know when I am following his guidance, because only at those times do I have peace. And with it comes a creative urge, propelling me into joyous expression and activity, or it gives me patience and a willingness to sit back when others must unfold the plan for me. I believe that this plan is a perfect part of the larger plan for the good of everyone and that my good can never be separated from theirs. I believe I may accept with radiant acquiescence all the persons and events that come into my life, knowing that they have been sent to provide me with God-given opportunities for spiritual growth and service. I believe that when I look out upon the world with trust and love, I shall see the shining threads in the all-over pattern which God has designed. And I shall discover that my own life is woven permanently into his eternal tapestries.